Can I invite you to take your Bible and turn to John chapter 16? It's page 902, although I don't think you'll need the page number, but I checked in the Bibles that are in the pews, and uh, you'll find John chapter 16 on page 902. As you're turning there, may I say what a privilege it is to be part of this conference and what an encouragement it is to be in the company of colleagues and in some cases mentors whom I esteem in the gospel. And I count it uh, a privilege and uh, I'm glad of the opportunity. Now I'd like to read from verse uh, 8 of uh, John chapter 16. Actually, I'll read from verse 5. John chapter 16, verse 5. And Jesus is speaking. He says, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Amen. Now, before we look at this, uh, we pause and pray. Our gracious God and loving Father, as we turn now to the Bible, and particularly to consider the person and work of the Holy Spirit, we pray that we will not grieve him by any of our words or our thoughts, nor that we would quench uh, his work in any way, nor that we would resist his will, but rather that we would come afresh to you in the awareness of the fact that unless you, Lord, build the house, we labor in vain, in the awareness of the fact that while one can plant and another can water, that only you, the living God, can make things grow, and in the awareness of the truth that you have set your immense power and treasure in earthen vessels so that the supreme surpassing power might belong to God and not to us. Hear our prayers, O God. Let our cries come unto you. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, despite all evidence to the contrary, it has been suggested that in 1492, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, it wasn't just as the history books have it. Apparently, we're told that when he set out, he did not know where he was going. When he arrived, he did not know where he was. And when he returned, he did not know where he'd been. Now, I mention that this morning because the very nature of the topic that has been given to me, the breath of the Almighty, the Holy Spirit, is virtually horizonless. And as I pondered it, it seemed to me that it possesses in itself significant potential for an address along the lines of the voyage of Columbus. Namely, that we might set out with any knowledge of where we're heading, get there, not know where we are, and return, and you're all going out for lunch saying, I wonder where we have just been. <laughs> when Jesus says the wind blows where it wills, and we don't know where it's coming from and where it's going, he's saying that about the ministry of the Spirit, not about the sermon. Unfortunately, it applies more to our sermons than it does to our understanding of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. 
Suffice it to say that considerations of any doctrine, but perhaps particularly of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, that is not grounded within the controls of the Bible itself, may readily and quickly lead to all kinds of flights of fancy. And I don't think there is any question but that at least in my lifetime, uh, there has been as much confusion within the framework of evangelicalism uh, in relationship to the person and work of the Spirit as perhaps to any other area uh, of the Bible. Calvin, in his Institutes, and uh, I, I'm told that you have to quote Calvin at least once or you're not allowed to come back. So uh, I, I have two quotes from Calvin, thus ensuring my return. But uh, Calvin, in his, in his Institutes, says, those who rejecting Scripture imagine that they have some peculiar way of penetrating to God are to be deemed not so much under the influence of error as madness. For certain giddy men have lately appeared who, while they make a great display of the superiority of the Spirit, reject all reading of the Scriptures themselves and deride the simplicity of those who only delight in what they call the dead and deadly letter. But I wish they would tell me what spirit it is whose inspiration raises them to such a sublime height that they dare to despise the doctrine of Scripture as mean and childish. And so we are set very clearly within the pages of our Bible. And I have chosen quite arbitrarily uh, to turn to this particular section although we might have gone to a number of places, and particularly to these words of Jesus, which he delivers to the Twelve during his last evening with them in the context of the upper room. And we might say that the main dimension that is represented in his words emerges from all that he has been telling them over a period of time, but now in a very purposeful and forceful way, concerning the necessity of his departure. He's been telling them that he must leave them, and as a result of that, it has been for them a source of consternation and of grief. In verse 31 of chapter 13, he says, My little children, I will be with you only a little while longer. And his departure is a matter of concern to them, and understandably so. It's not my purpose to work our way through the entire text from that point on, but it is significant what he goes on to say. He says, my little children, I'm going to only be with you for a little while longer, and then I'm going away. And the very first thing he says, and I want you to love each other. I want you to love each other. In the same way that when parents might even leave their children, they say, now we're going away for two weeks, and so-and-so is going to be looking after you, and make sure that you don't fight with one another when we're gone. I don't want to come back and hear that at all. I want to know and learn that you love one another. And so, in Jesus' terms, prove to be his disciples. He then says, and if you love me, in chapter 14, you will keep my commandments. And that love for one another is grounded in love for him, and love for him is revealed in our obedient lives. He then goes on in chapter 15 to let them know that the world hates them, he says, if the world hated, hates you, you should understand that it hated me as well. And in specific terms, he lets them understand that the time is going to come when they will actually be derided and they will be put out of the synagogues. Now, when you take all of that, and it will repay your own further study, when you take all of that, you realize that from the perspective of the disciples, if ever there was a time when they needed Jesus, if ever there was a time when they wanted so much the presence of the Lord Jesus, it was surely now. And it is then in that context that Jesus explains just why it is that he must leave them. Now, I have three points, and I'll tell you what they are so that we may have some sense of progress, um, at least hopefully so. First of all, that we would consider the necessity of Christ's departure then that we would consider the identity of the helper who is sent 
and then finally that we would say something concerning the activity of this helper or this counselor. First of all, then, Jesus is teaching the necessity of his departure. In verse 5, he lets them know quite clearly, I am going. I didn't tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going, he says in verse 5, to him who sent me. In verse 7, he says, and I want you to know that my going is to your advantage. I tell you the truth, or in the old King James, verily, verily, I tell you, it is to your advantage that I go away. And then in verse 7, he explains just why that is the case. Because if I don't go away, the helper or the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So the disciples were clearly in need of his help. And so Jesus lets them know that they need not be unduly troubled. That's John 14, the beginning of it, isn't it? Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Yes, I'm going away, but if I go, I'm coming back, and so on. And he says, I don't want you to be unduly troubled because help is on the way. You're not going to be left on your own. You are my little children, but John 14, 18, I am not going to leave you as orphans. You won't be left just wandering around by yourselves because I will come to you. Now, we're familiar with all of this, aren't we? It's nothing that is new to us. There's no peculiar discovery in it. But it is perhaps helpful for us to ponder just for a moment at what expense this promise was accomplished. That Jesus is not simply referring to the pragmatic benefit, if you like, of the arrival of another helper. But the necessity of his departure involves all that is to take place between now and his ascension when he will pour out the Holy Spirit as a gift upon those to whom he is presently speaking. And of course, as we reflect on the life and ministry of Jesus, we know that he lived his entire life in union with and in communion with the Father. Classically, when he's a boy of 12, Mary and Joseph come looking for him because he's been separated from them on their return journey to Nazareth. And they find him, you will recall, Luke ref refers it, us to it in chapter 2, in the temple and in the precincts with those who are the authoritative uh, scribes and rulers of the day. And he's engaged in discourse with him. And how it must have been for Mary and Joseph to look in and find him there of all places, and then to wait for a break in the conversation and to say as they did, Jesus, uh, we were looking for you and it's time for you to come home now. And then for him to turn and say, okay, but did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Or classically in the King James Version again, wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And Luke tells us that this was another thing that Mary put away in her heart to ponder later on. What a strange and enigmatic thing for this 12-year-old to say. We've been looking for you. I understand, and I'm coming with you. But I have to be about my father's business. And if you read the Gospels carefully, the sense of intimacy between the father and the son, an intimacy which was possessed in eternity before his incarnation, is pressingly meaningful and precious to Christ. Indeed, it is in the upper room discourse that you find him again and again referencing his relationship with the Father. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. This will be the work of the Father. This will be my work. He will send him. I will send him. Together, we will send him. And when he prays in John chapter 17, where we're taken, as it were, into the cloistered relationship of himself with the Father, it is just impregnated with that sense of intensity. Father, these are the ones that you have given me, and I've kept them, and none of them are left. Father, this is my request for them. I long for them to have my joy fulfilled in them. Father, I want you to look after them and keep them. Father, 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 Father. And then on the cross, piercing the darkness, the drama of his cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And his union and his communion 
is confronted by desertion and he is forsaken of the Father in order that his disciples will themselves not be forsaken. He is, if you like, in that peculiar moment in Calvary, orphaned as it were, in order that these whom he loves and cares for and those who will be like him, his followers after them, need not live in sorrow now. And it is the necessity of his departure which gives rise to this. How deep the Father's love for us, the hymn writers say. How vast beyond all measure that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How deep the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds that mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Now, the nature of this necessity lies, as I say, not simply in the benefit to his disciples of another helper, but in the entire drama of redemption, taking us back again into the councils of eternity, what is sometimes referred to by theologians as the covenant of redemption, so that that which the Father planned, the Son will now in his death procure. And that which the Son now procures, the Spirit who will come as a helper and as an advocate and as a counselor and as a comforter and a friend, will apply to those for whom Christ dies. And by the time the apostles are writing their letters, that which is introduced to us and revealed in the Gospels is now being explained and we read in Colossians and we read in Ephesians that what was actually happening that was that Jesus was ascending up on high and he was leading captives in his train and he was giving gifts to men and that is why gathered with his disciples on this occasion he says to them I am going to him who sent me I know that uh, you're not quite sure about this and I know that it fills your hearts with sadness nevertheless it is for your advantage that I go away it's absolutely necessity that I go away because I have come to do the father's will and this is the road I now walk well, that's enough, I think, on that. What then of the identity of the one who he sends as a helper? Sorrow has filled your heart. I'm telling you the truth. It's to your advantage, for I'm going away, and the helper, if I go away, will arrive the one that I send to you. Now, I don't want to build, bring coals to Newcastle by telling you information that, with which you're already familiar. You know that this word here is the word parakletos, which always was a difficult word for me as a small boy growing up. I won't tell you why, not because of its pronunciation, but it just sounded like something other than what it is. And in its technical form, of course, it has a legal dimension to it as one who would be an advocate. In its wider context, it speaks of comfort and of protection, of counsel and of guidance and so on. And so his identity as this counselor, as this helper, is given to us not only here but also in John 14 and in verse 13 of our present passage we are introduced to him also as the spirit of truth the spirit of truth now I think it's best if I just say a number of things concerning this uh, largely without any form of um, embellishment first of all we need to notice in terms of the identity of God's spirit that the Holy Spirit is a unique person and not simply a power or an influence. The Holy Spirit is a unique person and not simply a power or an influence. He is spoken of as he, not as it. It is as a person that he may be grieved. And this, of course, is a matter of import because if you listen carefully to people speaking, even within your own church congregations, and you may even have caught yourself doing it, you may have found yourself referencing the Holy Spirit in terms of the neuter. You may have found yourself referring to God's Spirit as it. And I hope if you do, you catch yourself immediately and you bite your tongue. Because it immediately sends us wrong, doesn't it? 
We have to understand that the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, is personal. And as a person, he may be grieved as a power, he may be quenched. In terms of the exercise of his will, he may be resisted. Secondly, this Holy Spirit is one both with the Father and with the Son. In theological terms, we reference the fact that he is both co-equal and co-eternal. That when you read this and the, John, the whole Upper Room Discourse, you discover that it is both the Father who is sending and the Son who is sending, and the Spirit comes and acts, as it were, for them both. So that the activity of the Spirit is never given to us in Scripture in isolation from the person and work of Christ, in isolation from the eternal will of the Father. And any endeavor to think in terms of the breath of the Almighty, in terms which are entirely mystical and divorced from Scripture, will actually cause us to take all kinds of side streets and doubtless end up on dead-end streets. Thirdly, in terms of identity, the Holy Spirit was the agent of creation. He was the agent of creation. Now, when you uh, read your Bible at the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis 1, as the uh, unfolding story of creation is therefore, as we read in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. We were thinking about this last night, weren't we? In terms of the ontological and the logical necessity of the, of the being of God. And here we discover that it is the breath of the Almighty that is hovering over the face of the waters. You know, the word in Hebrew for breath here or spirit is ruach. So it is the ruach Elohim that is the agent in creation. And it is not the immateriality of the Spirit that is referenced here, but rather it is the power and the energy of the Spirit, so that it is God's energy breathing out creation, as it were, speaking the worlds into existence, putting the stars in space, so that when you read Isaiah 40 and the question comes back, and who, who put all of these here? And who gave them all their names? Yeah, we come all the way back to Genesis 1 and verse 2. The irresistible power by which God accomplishes his purpose. Now, tangentially, you know, one of the Old Testament questions or the questions of Old Testament scholarship concerns the extent to which we are able in the Old Testament and from the Old Testament to discover the distinct personhood of God the Holy Spirit. In other words, can we understand the nature of his hypostasis in the Old Testament alone? And as I say, we're not going to delve into it, but when you read Genesis chapter 1, it is not difficult to see why it would be that here we have in the second verse, certainly in light of all that is subsequently revealed, a clear and distinct reference to the third person of the Trinity. And if I can recommend one other book to you on this very subject, I'm sure it is out there, but it is in the Christian Contours um, uh, series, I think published by IVP. The writer is one of our speakers here, Sinclair Ferguson, and it is as good a book on the Holy Spirit as I ever read. And in relation to this point, Sinclair acknowledges that if we recognize the divine spirit in verse 2 of chapter 1, it provides what some refer to as the missing link in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, where God says, let us make man in our image. And the observation is that this is then a clear antecedent reference to the Spirit of God at work in Genesis 1 and verse 2. It's a reminder, incidentally and in passing, that it is helpful for us to read our Bibles backwards. Because as we read from the back to the front, we discover uh, what uh, has become the uh, classic uh, word, I think, of Augustine, wasn't it? That the, that the old is in the new revealed, and the new is in the old concealed. I may, I may have turned it upside down, but that's largely it, isn't it? 
In other words, it is as we read through the Bible and as we come further on, we discover uh, the implications of that which is there prior. Fourthly, in terms of his identity, the Holy Spirit is the agent not only of creation but of God's new creation in Christ. He is the author of the new birth. John chapter 3 in the classic encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus and the inference there is so strong. And that, of course, is worked out in the rest of the scriptures. Fifthly, he is the author of the scriptures. He is the author of the scriptures. We're familiar with 2 Timothy 3.16, aren't we? And if we only know this word, we know this word Theopneustos because our pastor learned one Greek word and he says it all the time, that the scriptures were God-breathed. God-breathed. That what we have in creation is the Spirit breathing His energy and His power of God releasing in the act of creation, and you have the same thing in the act of redemption, and you have the same thing in the act of giving to us uh, the, the record in, in the Scriptures themselves, so that the doctrine of inspiration is entirely related to the work of God the Holy Spirit. And, and so when you come, for example, to Second Peter, uh, then Peter says the same thing as Paul does in a different way. He says, and these folks who wrote all these things in the past, we will remember, were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They were on a divine afflatus. They were not inventing things. They were not automatons. They were real people in real historical times with real DNA writing according to their historical setting and according to their personality. But in terms of the ultimate authorship of Scripture, it is dual. It was both Isaiah and it was God. It was both Jeremiah and it was God, because Jeremiah and Isaiah were picked up and carried along. Indeed, in Jeremiah's terms, the classic statement is that God has put his words into the mouth of his prophet Jeremiah without violating Jeremiah's distinct personality, and he then has spoken out the very word of God. Loved ones, this is why we study the Bible. This is why we pay attention to the Bible. Because this is a book that exists as a result of the outbreathing of the Holy Spirit. Now, his identity, as Jesus gives him to us, and we could go on ad infinitum here, but we must be selective rather than exhaustive. His identity is as another helper, another helper. And the word here is alos, it is not heteros, it is another of the same kind rather than another of a different kind. He is the one who comes parakaleo. He comes alongside. He is the one whom Jesus says to them, is with you, and he is the one who is going to be in you. His ministry is personal, and his ministry is permanent. He is the one who will remain with you forever. Thirdly, let's come to the question of his activity. If there is a necessity in Christ's departure in order that the Spirit may come, and if as the Spirit comes he accomplishes these, among other things, in the economy of God, then what are the active dimensions to which we are introduced by Jesus in this little section? Well, there is much in this, isn't there? And I'm inevitably going to have to be selective again. But let's just notice that Jesus says quite straightforwardly in verse 8, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. What else would a Holy Spirit do? How could somebody intrinsic holiness come into the dimensions of an impure world without confronting all of the chaos and sin that is represented in it? I was preaching in England just a week past on Sunday in a tiny Anglican church in the Midlands, and they gave me the lectionary for the day, and I had to go to this rather well-heeled congregation, and the passage for the day was the cleansing of the temple. And I said, oh, the cleansing of the temple, you know, these people will not like the cleansing of the temple because uh, they have a special Jesus who doesn't cleanse temples, not there at least in the Midlands, no. They have gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and so I knew what I was up against immediately. If I say that he took a whip and started to clear the place out, they'll be up in arms immediately. They'll shout out and perhaps leave. 
But I was helped, I think, in coming to it. And I try to point out to them what else could Christ do in his searing purity when confronted by all the chaos and exploitation that was represented in that scene. It was his absolute right and authority. It was a divine necessity to clean the place up to restore it to the purposes of God. My house has been made a den of robbers. Wish ye not that I must be in my father's house? I'm back in my father's house. It's 18 years since I was here, and what a horrible mess you've made of the place. Let's get this cleaned up, and let's clean it up right now. And you folks, you can head for the hills, and hey, pick your coins up and hit the road, Jack. <laughs> Who do you think you are? Give us a sign. On whose authority do you do such things? It's interesting, isn't it, that the folks never challenge what he did. They never say, why are you doing that? Because they were clever enough to know it was right what he did, and they should have done it. He did what needed to be done, but they said, on what authority do you do this? Do you have any kind of authorization for this? Yes, he says, I'll give you a sign. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it again. And you can just imagine them all putting their wooden heads together, trying to figure out what in the world he had said. <laughs> and then you have another classic illustration. The disciples themselves did not even understand these things, but afterwards they got it. Afterwards they got it in fulfillment of the promise that is here concerning the Holy Spirit. I will send another Holy Spirit. I will send the Holy Spirit another helper to you, and he will lead you into all truth, so that even the things that I'm telling you now that you find difficult to get, finally the penny will drop. And so it is that the work of the Spirit in Christ, through Christ, through the followers of Christ, is to confront the world by proving the world guilty. By proving the world guilty. I will come and prove the world guilty. I will prove it guilty of unbelief. I will prove it guilty of being entirely out of line, of their lives being like a crooked coat hanger that they could never straighten a la Ecclesiastes. I will prove before the plumb line of my absolute holiness and purity that every deviation from it is culpable. And I will bring the world's guilt home to itself. First, that the world is out of line. And second then, the work of the Spirit will be to bring the fact of that guilt home to the lives of individuals. Now, you have a wee foretaste of this, don't you? Before Christ expires on the cross. Because remember, in the conversation on the cross, the two fellows on either side are giving him what for. If you are the Messiah, there would be, maybe you could get down and maybe you could get us down at the same time. And then one of them says to his friend, do you remember this? Have you ever really thought about this? He says to his friend, he says, hey, I don't think we should keep this up. Because after all, we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then turning to Jesus, he said, Lord, Will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? What happened there? The Spirit of God confronted the thief in the dying embers of his life with the fact of his unbelief, with the fact that he was out of line, with the fact that he faced the very judgment of God. And you want to immediately reach for your hymn book and sing, I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, and creating faith in Him. It's to your advantage, Jesus says, when He comes, this is what He will do. And isn't that what He does? Pentecost arrives, the Spirit is poured out, Peter 
who's had moments of glory and days of disaster, steps to the fore and gives this amazing historical narrative concerning the nature of God's purposes throughout all of the time uh, of Israel. And eventually he gets to his point and he says to them, this Jesus you crucified and killed, and this Jesus God raised him up, and of this Jesus we are witnesses that he is both Lord and Christ. And being cut to the heart, the crowd called out, Man, brothers, what are we supposed to do? And he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that you might receive forgiveness for your sins. And immediately, that which Jesus has promised here in terms of the work of the Holy Spirit is if you like, in vogue. Now, we could go through the whole Acts, and we're not going to do it. But one more that I just want to point out to you. Don't you realize that this is what is happening in Acts chapter 24? When Felix and Drusilla have played enough Scrabble for a month, and they, they, they've run out of ideas. What do you want to do this evening? He says to his wife, I don't know. What do you want to do? Well, we've got that uh, fellow down there. He used to be Saul of Tarsus. He's down there. We could bring him up and let him, maybe he could do a sermon or something for us. Why don't, we, why don't we have him come up and give a talk? I mean, we can always get rid of him if he's no good. <laughs> oh, they could never have imagined, could they, as they sat there in an adulterous relationship. They could never have imagined that the man they brought up from the realm of captivity would stand and look them in the face and speak to them concerning righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. No mamby-pamby sermon from Paul. No attempt to try and get himself invited to the garden party, as it were, on the next occasion. No endeavor to try and sequester the opportunity for himself to be relieved of his bondage and to make his way safely out into the community again. Why does he do this? Because he must because that is what they needed to hear, because the world is guilty, and the world by the Spirit needs to be confronted with the fact of its guilt. The world is greedy, the world is selfish, the world is lost and alone, the world has succumbed to every kind of evil influence and lie. And the idea that to really preach the gospel is simply to offer pablum to these people in their predicament, to offer them a blanket, to make them feel a little more comfortable in their horrible circumstances, is to fail to understand what Jesus is saying when he says, it is to your advantage that I go away, because if I go, he will come, and when he comes, this is what will happen. Loved ones, this has been the mark of revival preaching, not revivalist preaching, but the preaching that has been marked by the inrush of the Spirit of God throughout church history, and not least of all, in these fair shores. But it's going to have to be in dependence upon the Spirit. It's going to have to be in this kind of hopefully winsome, but nevertheless direct and unequivocal fashion. I fear that many of us have lost the sense of both the sufficiency of God's Word and the authority of God's Spirit, thereby rendering our endeavors largely weak and ineffectual. And in all of this, the work of the Spirit is to be understood Christologically. In other words, always in relationship to the person and work of Christ. Now look at verse 12, would you? Don't you think it's very appropriate at 20 past 12, verse 12? <laughs> I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now.
because you will notice that what Jesus is doing is he's closing down the concentric circle, as it were. He says to them, this is, how the, this is what the Holy Spirit will do in relationship to the world. And the disciples must have said to one another, and I wonder how that's going to happen. And he says, well, let me tell you how it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit is going to come to you. And when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. In chapter 14, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have taught you. Here's my second quote from Calvin. <laughs> but what kind of spirit did our Savior promise to send? One who should not speak of himself, but suggest and instill the truths which he himself had delivered through the word. Hence, the office of the Spirit promised to us is not to form new and unheard of revelations or to coin a new form of doctrine by which we may be led away from the received doctrine of the gospel, but to seal on our minds the very doctrine which the gospel recommends. In other words, the unique prerogative of the apostles was to be brought into the understanding that they had failed to get. And when they were brought into an understanding of the truth, that they then, under the same inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would write down for us that which we now have in our Bibles, so that the truth to which Jesus refers is the truth that, as John Murray puts it, is deposited in the apostolic witness. And again, that speaks to the absolute necessity of paying cl close attention to our Bibles. Now, let me just say a couple of things by way of conclusion, I think. You will notice, too, that the activity of the Spirit is not only to guide them into all truth, but also to glorify Jesus, verse 14. He will glorify me, and how will he do this? Well, he'll take what is mine, and he'll declare it to you. And again, you only need to read into the early chapters of the Acts, and you see this happening. The Spirit of God glorifies Christ both to the disciples and in the disciples. And he comes, and he makes his home with them. And as he makes his home with them, so they will become increasingly like him. Because you become like those with whom you spend time. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. And you will find that the Father and I will come and live with you. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him, and make our home with him. Dear ones, this is a legitimate expectation on each of our parts. The communion with which, to, to which Christ refers in its unique dimensions to the apostles does not negate the dimension in each of our lives. That we have a right expectation of intimate communion with God. That it is not simply a trite little song, although I know it's often dismissed as a form of sort of superficial piety, to actually think in terms of, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. For part of the work of the Spirit is to assure us of our sonship, is to come to us when the evil one accuses us and rightly accuses us of our sins and of our failures and of our disconcerting rebellions and so on. And there we have an advocate with the Father, even the Spirit who enables us to say, as I know all of that and I know, Father, you know all of that, but I call you Abba, Father. And I thank you that you've come to live with me and in me. You see, if you think about it, it was a tremendous thing, wasn't it, for Jesus to go away? Because up until that point, uh, Jesus could only be in one place at one time. If he was in Nazareth, he couldn't be in Bethlehem. If he was in Bethlehem, he couldn't be in Jerusalem. But his departure and the sending of the Spirit universalizes the presence of Jesus. So he can be here and he can be in Grand Cayman. He can be here and be in mainline China. Not only does it universalize the, 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 the person of Jesus, but it also internalizes the person of Jesus. 
because up until this point he is with them he teaches them as it were they don't get much of what he says but he's not concerned because he knows that he will send this comforter and what is the ultimate work of the Spirit of God if it is not to conform the child of God to the image of the Son of God. I mean, how will I know whether the Spirit is really fulfilling His purposes in me, in my church, when I become increasingly like Jesus? You say, well, that's awful simple. I like simple. Someone says, well, no wonder you are simple. <laughs> God's eternal purpose is to conform us to the image of his Son, isn't it? That's what Romans 8 says. That those he predestined, he also called to be conformed to the image of his Son. So his, his purpose from all of eternity was to take you in Christ and make you like Jesus. What is he doing now? Just that. 2 Corinthians 3. We are being transformed into that same image. And when he finishes his work, what is it going to be? When he appears, we shall be like him. And everyone who has this hope within him purifies himself even as he is pure. But of course that makes perfect sense because after all, he is the spirit of holiness. Father, we thank you for the Bible and we thank you that we're able to go away and see if these things are so. And we take as our Concluding prayer, the words of the hymn writer, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Wean it from earth through all its pulses move. And speak to my weakness, mighty as thou art. And make me love thee as I ought to love. So that in all things Christ may be glorified and the Father satisfied. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.